5 o'clock. Log Talk Radio. You're listening to content developed by the GoPro Radio Network, the fastest growing network in the galaxy. GoPro Radio Network. Listen to the voices in your head. Are you ready for this? It's Wednesday, March the 2nd, 2016, and welcome to the BCS Experience. History, arts, culture, and politics in review and discussion. I'm Byron C. Saunders, your host with the most. The BCS Experience takes a look at our rich history, African-American history. We're going to share with you some known and and around the world. The BCS Experience, history, arts, culture, politics, in review and discussion. This is internet radio and will be aired live every Wednesday from 5 to 6 p.m. from the studios of the Iron Metropolis Images on the GoPro Radio Network. You see, I'm really excited the country and around the globe. I want you to tune in every week on your computer or your phone and I want you to become a loyal listener and I personally invite you to lend your voices to this radio show to express your opinions on my weekly topics. This is Social Network Radio at its finest. Now here's the number for you to call in to be a part of tonight's discussion. Call 347 884-9839. Once again, that number to call is 347-884-9839. All right, this week's topic. Oh my goodness. It's March 2016 and it's Women's History Month. And the BCS experience will honor extraordinary women who have made and continue to make contributions on our journey to freedom and to freedom land. This week, no ordinary shero. The true story of Joan Trumpower Mulholland, a civil rights icon. But before we get started, remember this, my show is the new Underground Railroad Express, all aboard to freedom and to freedom land. Now, you know, we always start off with some history so we can connect the dots. So here we go. The date, it's a Saturday. It's September the 3rd. It's 1803. You see, on this date, Prudence Crandall was born in 1803. She was a white American abolitionist from Rhode Island after being educated at a Society of Friends school in Plainfield, Connecticut. Crandall established her own private school for girls at Canterbury. The school was a great success until she decided to admit a black girl. Crandall, a committed Quaker, refused to change her policy of educating black and white children. The result? White parents began taking their children away from the school. And in March of 1833, with the support of William Lloyd Garrett, in Canterbury. Local people were furious at this and many tried to prevent the school from receiving essential materials. The school persisted and began to attract girls from Boston and Philadelphia. The local authorities then began using a vagrancy law that meant the girls could be given 10 lashes for attending the school. 
In 1834, Connecticut passed a law making it illegal to provide a free education for black students. Crandall refused to obey the law and was imprisoned, but won the case on appeal. When laws of the court decision reached Canterbury, a white mob attacked the school, forcing Crandall to close her school down. That same year, she moved to Illinois and married a Baptist clergyman. Prudence Crandall died in Elks Falls, Kansas on January 28, 1890. Wow. See, folks, you got to understand this, this struggle, this civil rights movement, it's not just got started yesterday in the 60s. It got started right from the very beginning. And both black and white and even Native Americans participated in an abolitionist movement to to destroy the system of slavery and oppression in this country. And guess what? It's still ongoing, 2016. All right, I want to hear from you. Let's connect the dots and make sense out of it all. Let's talk. Call me, 347-884-9839. All right, tonight, I have a very special guest that's joining us. Joining us in the GoPro studio this evening is my featured call-in guest, Joan Trampar Mulholland. The story of how the first white member of Delta Sigma Theta is an amazing woman. And this is our story on tonight's The BCS Experience. 1941, and is an American civil rights uh, act. She is. Uh, in my mind, one of those sheroes uh, that demands uh, respect and acknowledgement. Clearly, uh, she was a lady ahead of her time. She walked through that mob in the war store. And they realized, of course, immediately where she stood. She joins Perlina and Annie at the counter, the first white to join the demonstration. And at this, the crowd is just incensed. They become like hornets. They start screaming at her. She wasn't the outside agitator. She was a white Southerner. She was a white Southern woman. And so for that purpose, she was even more dangerous to the white supremacist power structure. Here's this white Southern woman who's supposed to be protected by the system saying, I don't need this protection and I don't believe in the system. And so that, made her incredibly dangerous. And that cell was 50 feet from the death chamber. Wow. That's where we were. Wow. As far as the state of... Joan Trompor Mulholland, you didn't know this p person by name, but you knew her picture. It's an iconic historic legacy. Anyway, she was born September 14th, 1941, and is, as I said, an American civil rights activist and freedom writer from Arlington, Virginia a 19-year-old Duke University student and part-time secretary in the Washington office of Senator Claire Engel of California. Joan Trompor arrived in Jackson, Mississippi by train from New Orleans, Louisiana as part of the June 4th ushered by Jackson police to a waiting paddy wagon once they arrived and all nine riders refused bail. Trompor was transferred to Parchment State Prison Farm, and in her interview for Freedom Writers, she recalls the harrowing conditions at Parchment, which included forced vaginal
for, and she is known for taking part in sit-ins, being the first white to integrate Tougaloo College. That's a HCBU, all, all black college. She was the first white to integrate in Jackson, Mississippi, and later became part of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. She later worked at the Smithsonian with the Community Relations Service and at the Departments of Commerce and Justice before teaching English as a second language at an Arlington Trompeau Mulholland to the BCS experience. How are you today? I thank you. Well, good, thank excellent. You for me. Well, Joan, you're a civil rights icon. Oh my gosh, you are the persons that stood up and put their lives on the line for our freedoms in our country. Take us back to that moment when you made a conscious decision to become involved in the civil rights movement and what was going on in America at that time. I think the turning moment was probably around 1950. Two at the latest, I was playmate every summer, Mary. We sort of dared each other to go walking back in that forbidden territory called Nigger Town. Mm -hmm. He's called that by the white folks, right. called the quarters yeah. by the residents. Yeah. Well, as poor as the folks were in the white part of town, unpainted shacks along a dirt road and right down the middle of the dirt road ran the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was really poverty. Yes. And it was so much worse than where the white folks lived. Mm -hmm. And it, when it, people were just sort of melted into the background behind their buildings, behind the laundry, behind whatever. So they wouldn't know anything about those two little white girls, I guess. And it was when I saw the school yes. that it was the turning point. That school was an unpainted shack, worse than any of the white houses. One room, pot-bellied stove, no glass in the windows. kids I had been to, and it was the fanciest building for miles around that I saw anyway. It was one of those post-World War II new mm -hmm. brick schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, the contrast was just so in your face that even I as a kid could see this was not fair, this was not the way it should be, and I pretty much vowed to myself that when I had a chance to make things better, I was going to seize the moment. And that you did. You did indeed. Your life took that turn. And how old were you then? I was maybe 10, 11 at the oldest okay. when Mary and I snuck off. You began to visually address and associate poverty and that of affluency. Oppression. Yes, the contrast. Yes. The unfairness. Yes. This was not. This was not what we said we believed in, either in church or in the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. And um, back then, of course, folks identified very heavily with their region of the country and their state. So, as a Southerner, I could see that we were the the worst on living up to what we preached on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And I felt we should quit being hypocrites and be honest about it and, you know, treat people the way we wanted to be treated. Yes, ma'am. Now, when you went to Duke University, we're going to jump ahead a little bit in your timeline here. And yes, you, were, you, you were 18, 19. Uh, you were, were you a freshman at Duke? 18, freshman. Freshman. Mm -hmm. And then... What made you, at that moment, make that decision to uproot your, your safe condition 
and then immerse yourself into what we know now as the modern day civil rights movement? Well, Duke is in Durham, North Carolina, and that was the second city to have sit-ins after Greensboro started it. Right. And, oh, it was all in the newspaper, and there were picket lines in front of the variety stores in town. And our Presbyterian chaplain, who had Sunday evening meetings for us, he told us that next week, this was in the spring, that uh, there would be some students from North Carolina College come over to our meeting and talk to us about the sit-ins. Now, we were to keep it sort of quiet because the administration could lock us out or the police could come busting up in there or rowdies show up. But just to pass the word on where we thought people would want to hear it. And so these well-dressed, well-spoken students came over and explained legally and morally about being able to buy stuff all over the store except their money wasn't any good when they wanted to get something to eat. Mm -hmm. And at the very end, lo and behold, they invited us to join them down on the picket lines and the demonstrations and all. So a few of us did, and that led to the um, And that's how we got involved. Sit -in. Yeah. Joan, I got to take a break here. And when we, yes, come, sir. when we come back, we're going to pick this story up. humanly to get involved into taking on the system. I mean, that's a critical point in your life, Joan, and I think more and more of us are seeing those challenges today as a result of some of the things that are going on in our country. But we will come right back, and we're having a great conversation learning about the past from a civil rights icon right here on the BCS Experience. So don't go away. Stay right with us. We'll be right back after these very important messages. You're listening to content developed by the GoPro Radio Network, the fastest growing network in the galaxy. GoPro Radio Network. Listen to the voices in your head. What if you can have an entire team of skilled professionals to help your business grow? admin, accounts, marketing, and more, but only pay for the exact amount of support you need at virtually the same cost you'd pay for one full-time employee. With Virtual Professions, you can. One contact, one number gets you a team of virtual professionals for exactly what your business needs. It's 1-888-315-VPRO. That's 1-888-315-8776. Or online at www.virtualprofessions.net. Virtual Professions Incorporated, because you mean business. You're listening to content developed by the GoPro Radio Network, the fastest growing network in the galaxy. GoPro Radio Network, listen to the voices in your head. All right. Already, we're back on the BCS Are experience. Are you ready for this? I am ready for this. I'm your host, Byron C. Saunders, the host with the most, and we're celebrating March Women's History Month. And we start off March with one of the most important civil rights icons living today who can tell us firsthand how and what it was like to participate as a white female and in getting involved in the civil rights movement with our dear friend, Joan Trompower Mulholland. She's on the line with us down there in Virginia. And Joan, you're at Duke University. You are just 18, 19, and, and you have been invited to sit in at a lunch counter because we know a lot of those sit-ins started right there in Carolina. Uh, and, and so tell us more. What was what were what were you in doing at that time that made you make that decision? Well, I was a Christian, yes, and I think that was the number one motivation that I had to practice what we preached. And we had had to memorize Bible verses back in grade school and junior high and all, and get that gold star in our. I thought we needed to do what we said we believed. 
and to treat people the way we want it to be treated and to love our neighbor and all that. And I wasn't thinking about being white. I was thinking about being a person, a fellow student. But being white, you could do things like take a seat first and order food, which would establish that people who had bought, well, you'd buy something in the store first and then sit down and order food. Well, it worked for us if we were white. Why didn't it work for the students from North Carolina College who were colored, as we said then? And um, we could even pass the food on over. We could melt into the crowd and witness what was happening, which, you know, could be useful to have a report and um, make phone calls back to to wherever the place was, you know, that folks were organized from. There were things you could do if you used your whiteness, but basically you were just there being part of the action, uh, moral support, mm-hmm. showing the unfairness, all that type of thing. Now, did you receive any violence or the, because, see, a lot of people think that when you did the uh, protest and sit-ins that you just showed up. I mean, people, folks today have no concept of what you had to go through before you even walked into that counter or, you know, stood on a picket line. Was there any kind of formal training to get you prepared for what you had to go through and experience? Well, now, which is sort of movement headquarters for the students where we stored our picket signs and gathered and all that. And we talked about nonviolence, that you don't strike back, and what do you do if someone spits at you or shoves you? You know, we had conversations, but I don't remember any of this role playing Mm -hmm. like they were doing over in Tennessee. Um, But there was a general feeling if you didn't feel you could be nonviolent that day, you didn't go, because there was plenty of other things to do to keep the movement moving forward. And... uh, or whatever it was that needed doing. Somebody had to drive cars to transport people sometimes. Yeah. Um, there, there was a job for everybody. Now, were there any recognizable leaders that were h- helping you all to orchestrate and organize this? Or was this just, just the local town community at that time who came together and said, as you know what? As far as I know, yeah. that was it. That now, was it. you know, I don't know everything mm-hmm. that was going on, but Floyd McKissick, um, who is an NAACP lawyer, he was sort of our, one of our leaders because the ministers took a prominent role. Um, but there was nobody who came in from up north and directed right. things. No. Right. That's a fallacy that's been perpetuated by folks who disagreed with us. Exactly. Um, now, when, when you, li- this, obviously, this, this protest, the sit-in, led to your next step in your involvement, which um, I think uh, uh, in reading your biography and, and reading this, your, your timeline, you became involved with the Freedom Riders. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Well, The students who were doing the sit-ins are the ones who kept the Freedom Rides going. Um, Freedom Rides started from Washington, D.C., and the uh, sit-in group, the Civil Rights Group, Nonviolent Action Group, NAG, at Howard University, Mm -hmm. we connected up with the, the folks who were planning to go on the Freedom Ride and met them and, you know, sort of hosted them, as it were, and... One of our members, Hank Thomas, was actually one of the Freedom Riders the, who first left. And um, there were others that we sort of knew, like John Lewis, because there were students on the Freedom Rides. It wasn't all adults. It was right. a good cross-section. Right. And after the buses, bus was burned in um, Alabama, in Anniston, and our buddy Hank was on it, mm-hmm. And then folks were beaten up in um, Birmingham. They couldn't keep going. They were just too physically done in. And so the students across the South kept the Freedom Rides going. Um, Three left immediately from Washington, D.C. 
And I got this call from Montgomery from Paul Dietrich, who was one of the Freedom Riders mm -hmm. from our group, and he said, Joan, we're trapped in the church in Montgomery. I can't talk, just send more riders. He knew I had a phone pretty near my bed. This was the middle of the night call. Yes. So we started getting more folks together uh, to go, and actually I think it was June 8th maybe mm -hmm. that I was with a group from D.C. that flew to New Orleans. By now, uh, the Congress of Racial Equality, who had organized the original uh, Freedom Ride, they were heavily involved in raising money for the tickets to, to get down there and all that, um, rather than just this folks taken off on their own. Yeah. So a group of us flew down, and that included my buddy Stokely Carmichael, yeah. and we were put up by folks in New Orleans for a night or two, and then we took the train over to Jackson and um, got arrested. It was by then so well organized, uh, and there had been a deal struck between the Mississippi officials and the Kennedy administration, no violence but you can arrest people on a local charge. So we were immediately asked to move out of the train station, and when we didn't, we were put under arrest for breach of peace. Yes. Now that basically meant that we, by our very presence, had upset other people's peace of mind to where they like wanted to take us out. So instead of arresting them for causing a disturbance, the Freedom Riders were arrested for upsetting them. Wow. And wow. it was it was scripted by then. Yes. Well, and I want to say the one thing that gave me hope that things were going to work out in the end, whenever the end came, was when I stepped out of the paddy wagon. Now, this wouldn't have happened if I were black. I have no doubt about that. Yeah. But the, it's a big step down, and the police officer reached over and took my arm to help me down, saying, we don't want anything to happen to you. And then it was like he suddenly realized I was that dreaded invader and jerked back. <laughs> yeah, wow. But his first instinct was good. Was humane. And that gave me hope. Yes. Now, now I got a, a two-minute piece to, on the Freedom Riders, John. We got a couple of, we got about three callers on the phone, and we'll bring them in shortly. But I want folks to realize okay. and got a, kind of got a grasp of that moment yesterday. See, we don't because we don't teach this in in our school systems and public education, even in college. There's no there's no formal education of the civil rights movement. So much of it has been missed and left uh, and left unsaid. And I want folks to kind of get a sense of the, the Freedom Riders. So we're going to play this tape, so it's about two minutes long, and I want folks to kind of get a sense of your engagement and involvement with the other Freedom Movement Riders themselves. Roll that tape. Okay. Now, I can't hear the tape. Well, the tape is rolling. Is is, is it playing yet? Mel, do we have it? Okay. Well, while it's loading, some of the names of the writers on the tape, jo on the uh, bus with you, Joan, because they were my friends as well. Stokely Carmichael, I worked with when he came to Washington and engaged along with um, uh, Marion Barry, the black, oh, yeah, the black, buddy. that's right, the Black Student Union Movement. Okay, so we're rolling that tape. Let's take a look at this, folks, because the Freedom Riders is something that is so important to the Civil Rights Movement. Let's take a look at that. Boarding that Greyhound bus to travel through the heart of the Deep South, I felt good. I felt happy. I felt liberated. I was like a soldier in a nonviolent army. I was ready. I'm sorry, our management does not allow us to serve niggers in here. The Freedom Rides of 1961 were a simple but daring plan to put blacks and whites on commercial buses. They would deliberately violate the segregation laws. These people are going from town to town and getting off the bus, Negro men and white women, to provoke acts of violence. 
the idea of going into Mississippi and going into Alabama and challenging segregation so frontally is something that alarmed not only those who oppose civil rights, but those within the civil rights community. I don't question their legal right to travel, but I question their wisdom. Some people can get hurt. How was that feeling? i just like to punch some of the, 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 them damn agitators right in the face. There was a mob, looked like a thousand people. They had these iron pipes. They were screaming, kill them niggas, and they had babies in their arms. They asked God to be with me, to give me the strength I would need to remain nonviolent and to forgive them. We'll take hitting, we'll take beating. We're willing to accept death. But we're going to keep coming until we can ride from anywhere in the South to any place else in the South. Buses are a coming, oh yes. Buses are a coming, oh yes. It was America. It was interracial. It was interregional. It was secular and religious. It was a shining moment. Your parents tell you, don't start something that you can't finish. Finish it. Wow. Joan, that's some powerful stuff that you were involved in with uh, Stokely Carmichael and C.T. Vivian and, and, and Glenda Gather Davis. I mean, the list is long. The, the heroes and sheroes that stood up. I got to take another break here, Joan. And when we come back, I got some callers. I need to bring them in. And I want you to continue to tell this story so that we can share with our listeners and the country and around the world the investment of your time being involved with a civil rights movement that was not just about black people, ladies and gentlemen. This was a global effort. We'll be right back in just a few minutes. Stay tuned. Come on. You're listening to content developed by the GoPro Radio Network, the fastest growing network in the galaxy. GoPro Radio Network. Listen to the voices in your head. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a great opportunity. If you have an event, product, service, talent, or something important to say, now is your chance. You can have your very own radio show. Whether you're just starting out or a veteran looking for a professional platform to enhance your presentation and following, the GoPro Radio Network is the premier place to cultivate and share new and exciting content. We can help you grow your audience and keep it growing long after your first broadcast. Now you have a voice. Call 212 212- 696-8562 or visit www.goproradio.com and you'll be amazed at how easy and affordable it is to have your very own professional radio show on the fastest growing network in the galaxy. GoPro Radio Network. Listen to the voices in your head. You're listening to content developed by the GoPro Radio Network. The fastest growing network in the galaxy. GoPro Radio Network. Listen to the voices in your head. All right, we're back on the BCS experience. I have my new friend, uh, Joan Trumpar Mulholland, who's down in Virginia, one of the original freedom writers. Female. You see, the country right now is going through some turmoil and stress politically, socially, economically, spiritually, and it's... Looks like to me, Joan, a lot of our people now are coming in back into the fold to say, you know, enough is enough. We got a couple. We got a couple of um, callers on the line, so I'm gonna bring them in and let's engage in a little conversation because I, then I want to have Joan continue to tell us about some of those freedom writers that she worked with. Good evening. Welcome to the BCS Experience. Who's on the line with us? Francois Craig. Francois, my good brother down there in Washington, D.C. Now, Francois Joan is responsible for me getting in contact and connection with you. He's been my, my brother from another mother for quite some time. And like yourself, he and I uh, have worked in the civil rights, uh, uh, working with 
Southern oh. Christian Leadership Conference. And now he's down in Washington, and you're going to Washington tomorrow to speak at his governmental agency. Isn't that correct, Francois? That is correct, Byron. You know, fortunate, and we are so fortunate to have, to have Joan to come speak tomorrow. And, you know, we have, we've been preparing for her all day today. And, Byron, I just want to add something. You know, Dr. Jahari Rashad invited me to come here, Joan, speak. And I went to speak and watch my arms, legs, because when you talk about the took that pill. has contributed more to the civil rights movement than more than the average African American that exists today. Yeah. And you know, and I take my hat off to her, and when you hear her whole story, you know, and, and, and I really just want to get this in, there was a lady who came before Joan. Her name was Angelina Grimke. Yes. Angelina had a sister named Sarah Grimke, and they were abolitionists. And they got to be with Samuel Cornish and Matt Turner and, you know, I mean, and Theodore Weld. And, you know, and if you know anything about history, history repeats itself. Because when you think of Angelina Grimke, all you have to do is think of Joan Mulholland. She paved the way. As Sarah and that Sarah, Sarah Grimke did, and I'm going to tell you, her story is fascinating. I'm not through with Joan yet. I'm calling people in New York. I and and, and Byron and I, as I talk to you, I see Meryl Street playing a part. I see a new script being written, and I'm talking to writers now who are going to be trying to approach Joan because this could this show could be Broadway any day, yeah. and no one, no one who has made a contribution like this lady. And John Lewis is a good friend of yours, Byron. Yes, he is. And guess what? <laughs> and he is a doggone good friend of Joan. Yes, he is. So Joan, what I really want to say to you is thank you for your contribution. And we are looking forward to you tomorrow. And I won't take up nobody else's time that has questions. Now, I uh, just love her. I love her. I love her. Uh, now, Francois. Thank you. You where... can swell my head between two of you. <laughs> Francois, where is Joan speaking tomorrow? Is this uh, open to the public or is it strictly uh, for the oh, federal yeah, government? So we're, we're, we're opening it to the public. And, you know, and another thing, Byron, you didn't get to mention, Joan is the only, and the, as I know of, and the, and the first white female that has been inducted into the Delta Sigma Theta. She is a sorrow. Yes, she, she is. is a Delta Sigma Theta. Yes. And believe me, the Deltas from all over Washington is coming tomorrow to celebrate Joan at the Office of Personnel Management, you know, and, and right in Washington, D.C. And believe me, it's going to be an awesome event. We're looking forward to sponsoring it. And even the Office of Diversity is just just on fire right now. And Joan came over last week and did a little video, showed some of her video and spoke on it. And you do not know, believe me, how this has been catching on fire. And, you know, those who don't know about Joan Mulholland, believe me, this is a historic icon. A lot of people can't say they were with Dr. King. He can. No one can. A lot of people can't say they have been with the civil rights leaders that was in their infancy at the time, Joan can say she she was there. She was there. So That's I right. celebrate her. Now, what time and, is and, that? And I, and I love picking her because she's got so much information. What time is that uh, uh, conference tomorrow in, uh, at the office of... Um... Of, of Office of Personnel Management. Yes, we're, we're starting at 10 o'clock tomorrow mm -hmm. morning. And believe me, we are just so excited, Byron. And where is that and located? all the employees there. Where is that located? Because our, our, lis our listeners and, in Washington and, might want to come. So where is that located? And, 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 Make sure yes, they have some right. coffee and cream for me. That's one of the oh, bad habits got, I picked we, up in prison. <laughs> yeah, we have plenty of coffee, coffee and cream. Okay, we have plenty of coffee and cream. 
And, you know, Barack Obama just uh, confirmed our new director. And, uh, and her name well, is Well, invite Dr. Barack Obama. to come over, too, you know. Yeah, we, 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 sent, we, yeah, we sent him an invitation as well, and it would be a wonderful surprise if he comes. But, yeah, but he's Beth a busy Coburn, man. Was, yeah, and Beth was just... Beth was just confirmed by uh, by Congress as Barack uh, 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 made her the the head of OPM. But let me share this with you. I gave her the John Mulholland tape, and she like, oh my god, uh-huh. I did not know. Making and history. she is so excited. So she is coming tomorrow to open the event for John Mulholland. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank All you. right. Well, g- folks in Washington, that's uh, 10 p.m., 10 a.m. tomorrow at OPM, and that's located where, Look, Francois? Uh, it's located, OPM is located right on 1900 East Street, Northwest, okay. Washington, D.C. All right, very good. So if you're in that area, folks, Linda Martin, you're down there in Upper Marlboro, you, you probably need to go see this. All right, we got two more callers on the air. Let's bring them in. Welcome to the BCS Experience. Who are you? And uh, let us know. Okay, welcome. Who's who's on the air with us? Hello? Okay. They gave up. They gave up. That's okay. <laughs> the number to call, 347-884-9839. That's okay, because, Joan, this is focusing on you. And as I was going down the list of the Freedom Riders, I mean, the list of the names bring back memories to me because, as I said, as a young uh, senior in high school in Washington, D.C., that's when I worked with Stokely Carmichael as they uh, worked around the country to create the Black Student Union movement. And then when I came to Atlanta and worked with Hosea Williams and his daughter and I went to Hampton, I worked with Southern Christian Leadership Conference and one of my mentors, C.T. Vivian, a brilliant, brilliant man who was one of your bus riders, your freedom riders. And I mean, the the list is uh, James Farmer. See, these are the names, folks, in our history that you don't get this story in your books. And it's a shame because the ignorance of America today is based solely upon the fact that they have not been given this kind of information. And if they were, our country would be in a much better place and we wouldn't have to be dealing with, we're gonna talk about it later, Trump and all that other craziness, but let's get back to the Freedom Riders. Let's just talk about, Joan, the thing that's impressed me about your story is you didn't run away. You, the, the, in fact, the, the more involved you came seemed to engage and move the, the movement forward because it needed people like yourself. You were a, a witness to our history during that time period. And so, you know, how did you prepare yourself for the unexpected? I mean, there had to be something that you weren't prepared for that just hit you smack in the face and said, oh, my God, this is America. Where did this come from? Is there any something like that? It's like you never knew what was going to happen. You see, my family, my mother's side of the family is from the rural south. Mm -hmm. And so I, I knew how these folks thought. And I was I was at home. The, the guys who were against us could be my relatives. Wow. My, you know, may have been. Yes. But that set me aside from the other white freedom riders who were pretty much from the North and anti-South. But for me, South was home. I knew what grits were supposed to taste like. Mm-hmm. I knew collard greens and things. And they just had no clue to the food, to the culture, to the music. And they were good people. But they were like prisoners of war, wow. and I was at home. Yes. And I think that made a difference, and we all want our house to be the best it can be, whether that means cleaning it or decorating it or whatever. And I wanted my home, the South, to be the best that it could be for all of us. Yes, and that, that's what was motivating me, and really, there was no turning back once you got into it. That's right. You were, you were in the movement 
the greater society did not accept what you were doing. Right. Maybe your family didn't, but the movement became family. I understand that because I know when I worked with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, I got to understand what the real definition of movement was all about. It got it meant that you got up and you got moved from one from one protest to the next, and you sang those songs. I, I never realized how important those songs were. Those freedom songs, as you were out there on the picket line. To get, that's right. I was the Jackson Movement secret weapon. I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket if my life depended on it. And we joked that, hey, if the police are coming for us, push Joan up to the front and have her sing just real loud, and those policemen will back away. Uh, yeah, but in I my head, I know all those songs. Yes, ma'am. And they still move me. They still move me as well, because I know those m moments when I was out there on the picket line with Hosea and, and Reverend James Orange and C.T. Vivian and all my friends who I met down in Atlanta. I remember, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. And I mean, you, you kept that moment and that physical movement going because if you stopped, you were blocking egress and regress and you could get arrested. So people don't know this. You had to learn this stuff, folks. That's why it's so important to keep our history alive and honor our sheroes like Joan Mulholland. All right, I got to take another break, Joan. And when we come back, I want to talk about two other women whose shoulders you stand on so that folks can understand this just didn't happen out of the blue. This has been an ongoing oh, no. freedom movement ever since the day we hit the shores of Jamestown, 1619. Amen. All right, so stay tuned, folks. We'll be right back on the BCS Experience right after these brief messages. You're listening to content developed by the GoPro Radio Network, the fastest growing network in the galaxy. GoPro Radio Network. Listen to the voices in your head. The views and opinions expressed on GoPro Radio Network shows are solely those of the speakers and are not necessarily the views or opinions of GoPro Radio Network, Inc. or its affiliates. These broadcasts are provided on the understanding that they do not constitute professional advice or services. Individuals who speak on these broadcasts express their own opinions, experiences, and conclusions. GoPro Radio Networks and its affiliates do not necessarily endorse or oppose any particular opinion or conclusion discussed in these broadcasts. You may not edit or modify or redistribute these broadcasts in any way without the express permission from GoPro Radio, LLC. GoPro Radio assumes no liability for any of your activities in connection with our broadcast or for your use of these broadcasts in connection with your website, computer, smartphone, tablet, iPad, or future listening devices. GoPro Radio Network. Listen to the voices in your head. You're listening to content developed by the GoPro Radio Network, the fastest growing network in the galaxy. GoPro Radio Network. Listen to the voices in your head. All right, we're on the last leg of our show this week, featuring Joan Mulholland, civil rights legend, Shiro, icon, speaking with us about those moments and days where she got engaged as a young 19-year-old woman leaving Duke University and, and becoming immersed in helping this country overcome racism. And it's still... The battle is still being fought, but let me just tell you, Joan Mulholland stands on the shoulders of two significant abolitionist women who helped pave the way for her. And we're talking about uh, Abby Foster, who was born January 15th. That's right, 1811. Now, she was a white American abolitionist and advocate of women's rights. And born near Amherst, Massachusetts, Abby Kelly, as she was known early in her life, began her crusade against slavery in 1837 after teaching in several Quaker schools as one of the first female lecturers before sexually mixed audiences, and audiences often greeted her with extreme hostility. So you think going to a lunch counter, you engaged in hostility? Imagine 
this young woman engaging in hostilities because she wanted back in the 1837 to make things right in this country. The next woman, you know this name, but you didn't know her involvement. We're talking about Susan B. Anthony, born Tuesday, February the 15th, 1820. Now, you know she's on the $2 coin, but did you know that she's as, as a suffragette that was one of the things that Susan B. Anthony, she was a white abolitionist and a white woman's rights advocate, a woman's rights advocate. So Joan Mulholland stands on the shoulders of some amazing, courageous women who you may never know their names. But let me tell you something. Write this name down, Joan Mulholland, because she paved the way for many of us, and we saluting her today and all the women whose names you may never know because they just weren't there written in the books. But Joan, let's move a little bit forward because as you can see, the hour goes quickly, okay? And, and it really does. And, and um, there's a piece that I, I wanna just drop in here right now. It's only 47 seconds long, but you know about Jane Elliott. And Jane has one of those, another one of those women who challenges us to talk about racism in a manner that says you need to stop thinking the conventional way, ways that you've been taught to realize that even when you don't realize it, you have been practicing racism. Roll that little 47 second tape there and let's just let, this is, she's challenging these white folks in an audience to acknowledge that they are indeed bigoted. I want every white person in this room who would be happy to be treated as this society in general treats our citizens, our black citizens. If you, as a white person, would be happy to receive the same treatment that our black citizens do in this society, please stand. You didn't understand the directions. If you white folks want to be treated the way blacks are in this society, stand. Nobody's standing here. That says very plainly that you know what's happening. You know you don't want it for you. I want to know why you're so willing to accept it or to allow it to happen for others. Wow. Wow. That's a powerful... Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And it's a deadly science, silence to that room because at that very significant moment, the understanding and the realization on those young white uh, males and females in that room realizing, wow, all this time I've been practicing racism and being bigoted. And, and, and felt privileged because I didn't have to engage myself in what people who are being oppressed had to go through every single day of their lives. And Joan, we, you and I talked about this last night. Yesterday was Super Tuesday, and this country is out of control politically and socially and spiritually. What, I, I, my question to you, because you've been there, you've done that, you bought the t-shirt, you gave it to your grandkids, and now you're being a witness to something you probably said, wait a minute, didn't I just come out of this nightmare? What's going on today, and where do you think this country is headed, given the current crisis of racial, misogynistic, gun crazy, and out of control political issues of the day? Where are we headed? I wish I knew. But it's frightening yes. to, to watch what is happening on the political level. Yeah. And it's like coming out of the woodwork with yes. this bigotry. It is indeed. It's gone beyond just, you know, being against black folks. It's gotten into religious levels. Yes. It's gotten into point of origin level. I mean, nobody's family came here as an immigrant because things were good back home, whether they came on a ship of their own volition or they came... On a slave ship, we all came because things were bad. Right. Exactly. Why should it? Why should we not welcome people who are coming because things are bad? We got another. I mean, Canada has yeah. taken in twenty-five thousand Syrian refugees in a month. What have we done? That's right. What have we done? We got another well, caller on the phone. Much. Yeah, we got another caller um, on the phone, so let's bring him in. Hello, welcome back to the BCS experience. Who are you? 
Hello? You're on the line. Okay. I'm going to well, move. Well, well, Byron, Byron, I want to jump in here, you yeah, know, and yes. I want to say this. You know, after seeing Joe Mulholland, I made uh, a vow in myself that her story will be told. I am going to spread this story while we have her in the midst Amen. of our company. Yes. Her story needs to be told. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of African Americans have their stories. But here we have a courageous white female who's, who, who stepped out and said Black Lives Matter before we even knew that Black Lives Matter or that we even pronounced the words Black Lives Matter. She took a stand at such an early age, and not only the stand for us, but guess what? The things, and Joan tells a story about her family takes her to Europe, and they try to entice her to not to go back to the movement. And, you know, and, and Joan could have easily said, well, no, I can go with society, and I can be the debutante girl and do all the wonderful things a beautiful white girl would do. But no. That would be so she boring. Took, <laughs> she took the steps, and she did. She, and that's why, Byron, not just, you know, when you take a stand with your family yeah. and you stand on your convictions, that's why Joan Mulholland is a godsend. I will preach it till the day I die. I will talk about her till the day I die. And because she has taken the test. All right, I got four minutes left. I got two videos now, to, to get in here. I want to say yeah, go ahead, Joan. the importance go ahead. of getting my story out yes. is if it inspires some younger person exactly. to have their story, exactly. to go and right. do something. I've had my turn yeah. now. You younger folks, it's your turn. I saw two things on the TV yesterday that dis were so disturbing. One was in Valdosta, Georgia, which you know about uh, uh, Francois and Joan. They, uh, that campus, those students on that campus need to sue that school because they had, a, uh, Trump had a, uh, uh, a, a, a program down there, a rally in which the black students at the black students of Valdosta State College were asked to leave after their silence of being there, not saying anything, not raising any questions, were asked to leave from a public institution which basically is allowing a KKK type of uh, rally on a public institution's campus and they need to sue Trump and the, and, the, and the state of Georgia for allowing that to happen. The second thing I saw happen, which was ex even more disturbing, was a young black woman in Louisville, Kentucky, roll this tape, it's only 38 seconds long, but she was manhandled and repeatedly assaulted at a Trump rally in Louisville, Kentucky. Roll that tape. Today with several interruptions by anti-Trump protesters. It was Governor Chris Christie who came out first and introduced Trump. Trump spoke for about 30 or so minutes. When a protester did interrupt him, Trump would yell, get them out of here. And many were escorted out by police. Some protesters had signs that read, love Trump's hate. Uh, some wore shirts that read Muslim American or Mexican American. Another thing that Trump uh, mentioned several times was the Saturday Republican caucus. He asked many people, many supporters to promise. Okay, was that the Valdosta one? No, that, that this this one. That's the one right there where that young lady was actually assaulted. No one, not the police. This was in Louisville, Kentucky. This reminded me of, of just watching uh, the, 90 the, seconds. those days when we had to be confronted with it all. Joan, I want you to come back on my show sometime. My time is all out. Francois, thank you for introducing me to this civil rights icon as we celebrate Women's History Month. Yeah. And I want to go in my show with the blackish one minute and 46 seconds of, of their really a groundbreaking statement that they made last week. Y'all have a good time down there in Washington. Seconds. Play that tape. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joan. God bless you. And continue to walk that walk and talk that talk. That's what the civil rights all movement is all about. There, go do it. Go do it. Roll all that right. tape. Roll that all tape. Right. Uh, enough! Wake up! Let's
let's say they listen to the cops and get in the car. Look what happened to Freddie Gray. Yeah, and what if they make it all the way to the station? Mm -hmm. You remember Sandra Bland? And let's say they do make it to trial. Mm -hmm. You see where that gets us? Don't you get it, Bo? The system is rigged against us. Maybe it is, Dre. But I don't want to feel like my kids are living in a world that is so flawed that they can't have any hope. Oh, so you want to talk about hope, Bo? Obama ran on hope. Remember when he got elected? And, and, and we felt like maybe, just maybe, we got out of that bad place and made it to a good place. That, that the whole country was really ready to turn the corner. You remember that amazing feeling we had during the inauguration? I was sitting right next to you. And we were so proud. And we saw him get out of that limo and walk alongside of it and wave to that crowd. Tell me you weren't terrified when you saw that. Tell me you weren't worried that someone was going to snatch that hope away from us like they always do. That is the real world, Bo. And our children need to know that that's the world that they live in. Thank you for listening to the watching Let's see what they're going to say next. That's our show for this week. Thank you so very much. We love you. And continue to walk that walk and talk that talk. I'm out of here. Peace and love always.